Brethren, today I've chosen from Solomon the presentation entitled First Degree Questions, which in summary is a short presentation which explains the meaning of the questions leading from the first to the second degree. So as an introduction, note that the first degree Freemasons are called entered apprentices, not just apprentices. In the Middle Ages, when a young man wanted to learn a trade, he was apprenticed to a skilled craftsman for a period of five to nine years. An indenture or contract would be drawn up in which the master craftsman would agree to inform the apprentice, not later than the end of the second year of his apprenticeship, whether he was likely to make the grade or not. If the apprentice's work and aptitude were satisfactory, then he would be entered in the register of the relevant guild or company, thus becoming an entered apprentice. This is especially relevant when past masters are interviewing potential candidates for Freemasonry. They are not looking for raw recruits or apprentices, but for men who have already shown in their lives and actions that they are likely to become good Freemasons, i.e. entered apprentices. So what is the meaning of this following piece of ritual? The worshipful master asks a question, the candidate answers. Where were you first prepared to be made a mason? In my heart. Where next? In a convenient room adjoining the lodge. Describe the mode of your preparation. I was divested of all metals and hoodwinked. My right arm, left breast and knee were made bare, and my left heel was slipshod, and a cable toe with a running noose was placed around my neck. So let's examine the last answer phrase by phrase. Divested of all metals. The first explanation is given in the address in the northeast corner, when the candidate is encouraged to recall that since he was poor and penniless when he became a mason, he should be sympathetic towards a brother needing his charity. It is also a symbol of removing all his worldly goods, so that the new mason can concentrate on the beginning of his masonic journey of moral improvement, without the distractions of money and worldly goods. This lack continues in the second degree, but metals are reintroduced at the beginning of the third degree, when he is considered sufficiently advanced in his journey to deal with the additional moral problems associated with worldly possessions. The aprons of entered apprentice and fellow crafts have no metal on them, not even clasps, but those of master masons have a metal snake clasp, the snake being a symbol of wisdom, and metal tassels the seven balls representing the seven liberal arts and sciences for that reason. Hoodwinked. The first care of every Freemason is to see that the lodge is properly tiled, that is to say secured, and that only authorised Freemasons are present when the lodge is at work. When the candidate enters the lodge room, he is not yet a Mason so he is prevented from seeing who is present and the layout of the lodge until he has taken his obligation to keep the mysteries of Freemasonry secret. Second, his Masonic journey is from darkness to light, from ignorance to enlightenment, so the wearing of the hoodwink and its later removal remind him of that. My right arm, left breast and knee were made bare. This is a link back to the medi medieval operative masons. Women were not permitted to work as stone masons, so bearing the breast confirmed the brethren that the candidate was not a woman. <clears throat> stone masons did hard physical work, and the bearing of the arm and leg shows that the candidate is fit for hard physical labour. The operative masons did not admit anyone with a physical disability. The phrase in the ceremony when the master orders the candidate to perambulate the lodge to show that he is fit and properly prepared refers not only to him being suitable, but also to him being physically fit. 
my left heel was slipshod. The lodge room is a sacred space, and so the candidate removes his shoe because he is standing on holy ground. As God said to Moses from the burning bush, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the ground whereon thou standest is holy ground. This is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 5. In Scottish Freemasonry, the candidate removes his slipper and gives it to the master before taking his obligation, since giving someone a shoe was a symbol of sealing a pledge in the Old Testament. So that comes from the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 7. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to conform all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbour. And this was a testimony in Israel. And a cable toe with a running noose was placed around my neck. On the point, like on the point of some sharp instrument presented to my naked left breast, which follows, is the simply part of the security of the tiled lodge, as is made clear in the explanation which follows in the obligation. The worshipful master asks, on what were you admitted? And the candidate replies, on the point of some sharp instrument presented to my naked left breast. Question two. Where were you made a mason? in the body of a lodge, just perfect and regular. And when? When the sun was at its meridian. Freemasons' lodges in this country, being usually held in the evening, how do you account for that which at first sight appears a paradox? The sun being the centre of our solar system, and the earth a spherical body constantly revolving round it, and on its own axis, and Freemasonry being spread over the whole habitable portion of the globe, it necessarily follows that the sun is always at its meridian in respect to Freemasonry. So let's examine the last exchange between the Worshipful Master and the Candidate. Just, perfect and regular. Note the comma just after just. The lodge is just and perfect and regular just because the volume of the sacred law is always open when the lodge is at work. Perfect, when seven or more Freemasons make a lodge. Perfect, and there have been seven Freemasons present for an initiation to take place. Regular, because the lodge has a warrant from a grand lodge and is on display. When the sun is at its meridian. The master is placed in the east because the sun rises in the east to enlighten the day. The master opens his lodge and enlightens his brethren in Freemasonry. The senior warden is placed in the west to mark the setting sun and to close the lodge, having seen that every brother has received his just due, in other words his wages. This refers back to the Middle Ages, when most people worked from dawn till dusk. The junior warden marks the sun at its meridian. We can easily picture the sun rising behind the master's chair and passing over the junior warden's chair whilst at its meridian at 12 noon, before setting over the senior warden's chair. The candidate's Masonic journey is towards the light and enlightenment, so every Mason is said to have been initiated when the sun was at its meridian so that at the beginning of his Masonic journey, he can clearly see where he is heading. The full explanation of why the sun is at its meridian when a candidate is initiated is given in the final part of pure ancient Freemasonry, the supreme order of the Holy Royal Arch. The sun being at the centre of our solar system, this answer reminds the candidate of the universality of Freemasonry being spread over the whole world. Question 3. What is Freemasonry? A peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. 
name the three grand principles on which it is founded, brotherly love, relief and truth. So again, examining that particular exchange, here particular means discrete or separate. The Masonic system is veiled in allegory so that its teachings can be interpreted in any place, at any time and in any culture. The symbols of Freemasonry are universal symbols adopted in order to illustrate its message. Some explain the system by saying that Freemasonry makes good men better, others by saying that it provides the support to enable an individual to improve himself in all aspects of life, particularly in his education and morals, in order to become the best person he is capable of being. All candidates feel the brotherly love that fills every lodge. They will also be well aware of Freemasonry's commitment to charity. But what does truth mean in this context? The short answer is two phrases from the volume of the sacred law. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 and love thy neighbour as thyself. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. The two great commandments given by God to Moses. Charity is the practical embodiment of loving your neighbour. It is also important to remember that masonry does not stop at helping our brethren only, but stretches out the hand of friendship to the popular and uninstructed world to do good to all mankind. That, you might recall, is from the Masonic Chain of Union performed at the First Degree Festive Board. Many non-Masonic charities receive donations from Freemasons, including air ambulances, mountain rescue teams and transplant funds. Freemasons also sponsor five postgraduate research scholarships at the Royal College of Surgeons, and Masonic charities are usually among the first to make donations to natural disaster emergency appeals. Masonic charity is truth exemplified as relief and founded on brotherly love. Question four. Who are fit and proper persons to be made masons? Just and upright men, free by birth, of mature age, sound judgment and strict morals. How do you know yourself to be a mason? By the regularity of my initiation, repeated trials and approbations, and a willingness at all times to undergo examination when properly called upon to do so. How do you demonstrate that proof to others? by signs, tokens, and the perfect points of my entrance. So note that it says free by birth and not just free. When the ritual was being revised at the beginning of the 19th century, there was considerable public debate about the morality of slavery, which eventually led to the Abolition of Slavery Act of 1833. This phrase was included to stop slaves who had been freed or emancipated to, from becoming Freemasons. It was one of the less attractive views held by the Duke of Sussex, Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England, 1813 to 43. An approbation is a formal approval. If Freemasons have a fault, it is that they are overzealous in their approbation of their brethren. It's certainly never lacking. There are many definitions of the perfect points of entrance. Nowadays, they are usually defined thus, of, at, on, of my own free will and accord, at the door of the lodge, on the point of some sharp instrument. Brethren, can I recommend to you further reading? Harry Carr wrote The Freemason at Work, which is published by Lewis Masonic. This book is in the form of questions and answers, 
so it can be used as a reference text if you have a specific question or just to dip into as part of your daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. Roy Wells, who, under, who wrote Understanding Freemasonry, also published by Lewis Masonic. Wells covers much the same ground as Carr, but from an historical perspective, providing the origins of phrases used in the current rituals from early rituals. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, brethren, and you'll be looking forward to the next presentation that I shall make in about a week's time. Thank you very, very much for your kind attention.